Hey everyone, morning, morning. Uh, apologies if um, you came to this talk expecting it would, be neatly, it would be neatly packaged and instead if I, I ramble because for one thing I'm still jet lagged. Uh, but the way I like to look at it is that's really the story of data science in the last 10 years. Much like my career history, it's been about being renamed many, many times, doing lots of things, whether it's modeling, or whether it's data work, uh, for all different sorts of maturities. At least that's how I like to sort of justify my job hopping every year. Kelsey Hightower calls it being a career mercenary, which I think is a much more like sexier uh, way to describe it. So uh, who here has seen one of these videos? But maybe you saw it for like data engineering or what have you. Now let's be real. How many of you wet the bed a little bit? when ChatGBT came out and everyone's like, oh, data engineers are gonna be replaced. Or ML ops engineers, or you name it. No? Okay, because I had an existential crisis for about a month. I even swore off of LinkedIn, you know? Just didn't post anything on LinkedIn, because I was just like, oh my god, what has my life come to? All these years of building data pipelines, working as a data scientist, all the other stuff, dealing with Kubernetes. I mean, if I knew I could just skip the Kubernetes part, then I would have just done that paying the same expensive rent in SF. But I think it's kind of important because, so Chad earlier kind of gave you the data engineering, the data ops, the data governance perspective. But the theme that I think I've observed, and probably many of you have, have observed, is this weird kind of artificial divide between the different tribes of data and ML. Which is kind of interesting, right? Because there's this assumption that to do ML, you need to be data mature. And the whole point of data maturity is to do machine learning or data science. So I'm gonna give you some stories, uh, kind of the way an anthropologist would sort of you know, pursue an ethnography of kind of the different groups. And it's partially related to my background. Uh, so as Lars was kind enough to mention, you know, when I, uh, in terms of early career, I went from being like on the growth side as an analyst to working as a data scientist for Autodesk and Teladoc, to working on the ML platform team over MailChimp. And then finally, to kind of expanding that scope of work to you know, deal with uh, companies in kind of various states of maturity in terms of adopting something like Feature Store. So I drew most of you in with this idea of the full stack data scientist is still the sexiest job. So let's just kind of ground ourselves and what do I even mean by that? So this is a very helpful definition from Shopify uh, where one of their principles is they essentially hire engineers for their ML roles. So there's a couple themes in terms of their definition. One of, it, one of them is end-to-end -end ownership of a pipeline. You have the ability as a human Swiss army knife to execute on any kind of task, whether it's pulling the data sets, developing the models, training them, doing experimentation, and deploying them. And in terms of what makes a successful full stack data science, yeah, there's the technical part. There's also some amount of communication, understanding the business. But in the, like, why does the question even matter? Because since time immemorial, even since, let's say, I don't know, 2015, when the data scientist style really started picking up, there have been questions about, frankly, uh, how useful are data scientists really? If we think of them almost as a species, there's a lot of risk factors, much more than koalas, shall we say, of which apparently 89% have been wiped out in the last 10 decades, so I hope all of you are very keyed into your conservation efforts. Well, one, one reason why this question is relevant is because everything is becoming ML. There was a point in time where it was like, you know, there are probably some industries that won't be touched by ML because they're highly regulated or they're small, or even because of the geopolitics of access to data and tooling. But that's no longer becoming true. A lot of countries who, you know, we would normally in the West have labeled as developing countries are catching up quite rapidly and are poised to kick our butts. 
A good place to see this, as many of you, uh, I understand, are in banking or financial services, is the adoption of technology by banks. Banks are typically very, very uh, conservative in their technology adoption. They serve as the canaries in the coal mine. Yeah, canaries in the technical coal mine. I know for one thing, uh, I would not want my hard-earned dollars, um, especially with inflation as it is, just being played willy-nilly, kind of like gambling. And the use cases for ML, as we know it, are quite vast. But what's interesting is the fact that a lot of the most hyped up use cases, you know, those, those are fascinating. Those are like POC projects. Those are super fun to talk about, like a lot of the LLM projects. But what's really interesting is when you see it in terms of like inventory management, when you see it in terms of like IoT use cases. Apparently, uh, something like mining is really big in Australia, especially in Perth and a little bit in Brisbane. Apparently, some very, very cool like actual computer vision work you guys are doing. The second reason why it's really important to kind of address this question is that everyone is doing ML differently. So for anyone who tries to say that there is an ML ops stack, a singular ML ops stack, much like there was a modern data stack, well, we didn't have that movement. More importantly, there's actually no one way to serve ML. Many valids, many different patterns are valid in the same company. So for example, over at MailChimp, we engage in a couple different patterns of serving ML, all of which were valid. The first pattern was your typical batch. You train a model, you run it across the table, and you create predictions and inferences, and then you serve them, right? In our case, we were using GCP, so we essentially copied it over a spanner and then served it through our like serving fabric. We could also kind of do it as a live service model, containerize it, deploy it, dot predict. All these methods are fine. One of my colleagues over at Riot Games, who works on the League of Legends platform, his approach is different, and his team's approach is different, because most of the work they're doing is, in fact, in real time and streaming, and they have to do that because they're doing in-game recommendations. Very, very custom stack. There may be a hint of AWS and GCP, but if you were to you know, drag him to the side for a drink, he would probably complain a lot more about CUDA and having to write custom libraries than he would actually about GCP and AWS. Uh, now, the third reason why this question is important is prompt engineering. Yeah, apparently prompt engineers are hot, new, making 300K over at OpenAI. Man, I'd like to get that kind of money. Especially given um, how limited the skills and experiences are to uh, get that job. Apparently, all you need to do is like do some kind of like rag retrieval you know, on a bunch of embeddings that you create on data using an embedding model that you store in a vector database, that you serve it up in a chatbot or a Q&A, and then boom, money. You know, what's really funny is that when you actually try looking up what this role is, uh, I think we can all kind of grok the, you know, understand AI and ML and NLP, uh, developing scripting programming skills, those are important. It's vaguely generic, but you know, that's okay. Um, define problem statements clearly and specify de detailed queries. Develop your conversational skills. Learn about writing and art styles and building ex expertise. So basically, uh, the prompt engineer is the more uh, socially adept and communicative segments of you guys. Apparently, that's what a prompt engineer is. It's, it's an engineer that actually knows how to talk to people that are not engineers and can write. Yeah, it would have been good to get those uh, reps in with your documentation, right? Now, of course, uh, I don't know if any of you remember this, but at one point, McKinsey, it was about 2015, 2016, was trying to push this role called the data translator. Now, interestingly enough, that data translator role has not really come up. Uh, and more importantly, a lot of the pushback was, uh, yo, a lot of these skills of data translation, first off, why are we parking it into a single human body, given that communication about data is complex? Uh, more importantly, why can't existing people use it? And I think the same question could be posed of ML products. Why is it that existing professionals in marketing, product, and sales can't be consumers, 
but also extenders of that technology. Now the fourth one, this is really great. So uh, you, you know how I mentioned you guys that like this was gonna be very conversational? Uh, part of it is because a lot of the stories I'm gonna drop to you, I don't actually want on the slides because these will get shared. And I kind of don't wanna hear back from a lot of the big names in Silicon Valley. If I just talk about it without mentioning names, then you know, plausible deniability. Um, so apparently foundational models means no more ML development, means no more feature engineering, no, means no more featureization. Uh, really, apparently foundational models are just gonna do everything for us. Um, and more importantly, uh, foundational models that are owned by other companies, proprietary models, they're just gonna kill everything. All innovation is gonna be killed. But I personally don't believe this. Uh, first off, I don't believe you guys are easy to replace. Uh, I'm gonna show you some numbers about why I believe that. Uh, number two, I don't necessarily believe that LM Ops is a thing, which I know I'm gonna get crucified for this like over in the ML Ops community. Um, but more importantly, I think a lot of the skills are coming out of LMs and LM Ops. I really just don't see why they just can't be another skill set that all of us sort of adopt. But let's go back in time to history, right? Because this talk is about kind of the full stack data scientist. And one of the arguments I'm gonna make, frankly, is that this idea of extinction of a role that frankly was sort of very loosely defined anyway, of a role that has changed over time as it's changed with tools and technologies, is a little bit over-exaggerated. Now the early statisticians, that these were the guys that were the early people, big data days. They were code fluent statisticians. There was a lot going on. Uh, don't worry about taking a screenshot, by the way. Because there are 170 slides in this presentation. No, that does not mean you're gonna be here for 170 minutes. But it does mean that I share the slides, understanding that these get passed around. So, back in the early days of big data, and I know most of you know this, but I also like to hear myself talk. Um, traditional software was code to data. Data did not matter only in so much as it did not screw up your code and it did not screw up your application. I know that's a little bit of a hot take, but many of you will agree with me. Now, I'm not gonna say the HBR post like generated the data scientist role, but it put a label on it. Because industry was making this transition to not just code is just written and is implemented on data, but data drives model which drives code. So of course, DJ Patel and Davenport, they wrote this HBR blog post, uh, Data Science Sexy Job of the 21st century, this was in 2012. Now interestingly enough, um, also around that time, back when uh, you know, we didn't hate kind of social media platforms as being disruptors of, government, of you know, democracy and governance, uh, there was a lot of innovation going on. So for example, over at LinkedIn, DJ Patel had coined the data scientist title to essentially justify some kind of spending for a Skunk Works team. Uh, over at Facebook, uh, Chamath and a few others had coined the growth hacker role. So growing um, importance understanding that you kind of need someone who could build, who could kind of span both worlds, even if they weren't really good at it necessarily. So Josh Wills, everyone remembers this one. Person who's better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician. Um, some so, sort of overlap this was Hillary Mason, who is the chief data scientist over at Bitly. Awesome nerds. Not just nerds, awesome nerds. And those first early years were, were tough. I don't know how many of you actually remember using the early like libraries of R or Python. Uh, maybe Scikit, like Scikit-learn was kind of a thing, so was Pandas, but you still had to end up going back to NumPy to like write most of your transformations. It was rough. So that was kind of the first cycle of data science. It was very heavily academic. It was really whatever they could kind of get their hands on in terms of data. 
and data was sort of big, but it wasn't like big, big. It was just like bigger than what could fit on your laptop. Until someone decided that Hadoop was a really great idea, right? So now we've come into the second stage where we're like, okay, so we have all these really smart people working on data science, working on machine learning, uh, except they keep on repeating zero to one and one to five over and over again. So how do we kind of scale out from like 10 to 100? And how do we do it in a way that uh, makes for a really nice diagram and is very cyclical? Now, like I mentioned, right, all the tools were kind of rough. And yes, this is a picture of one of my tweets. I'm lazy. So if I write it down someplace once, I don't really want to repeat it. Um, but a couple different things, right, Mainly that a lot of these problems of data and ML were being solved at different layers. There was no real unifying abstraction that you could actually even get at. Because for example, scikit-learn was still being developed. Spark maybe came in like, what, 2015, 2016? All these tools are now being used. Docker and Kubernetes even wasn't, wasn't exactly around the last 20, 30 years. So all these tools that are very popular in terms of data science and ML workflows, they were rough. Now, a lot of people in ML ops would say that the, cat the category creation of ML ops kind of started in 2014 to 2016, 2017, with machine learning, the high interest credit card debt, a uh, card of technical debt by Scully and friends, which is, they're responsible for that diagram that you see all the fucking time. Then they also created the uh, test score paper which was one of the earliest attempts to actually codify, like, what does quality look like? Now, since then, we've exploded in terms of options and landscape. I'm sure many of you have seen this Mad Turk landscape, and granted, it includes both data and ML, I will give you that. But that is a lot of tools, especially when you consider that this was 2012. Now, he didn't get all of it, but that's like a tiny square. It's like a pixel in the bigger landscape. Now, the interesting hypothesis, of course, is if you have better tools, therefore you should see less of them. You should see people doing more with less, right? Uh, yeah, how's that going? So many tools and services out there. And yet, this is what people's platforms actually look like. And there's no shame in that, because it works. More solutions, more problems, right? And the interesting thing is that we always think having more choice is good, more tools is good. But if all of you remember kind of the famous jam experiment, if you don't, let me just give you the rundown. They had two tables at some Costco-like, Costco or Woolworths-like place. I think Woolworths is your store of choice, right? Um, one table, you could have multiple tastes of jam, and the other, you had less. And guess what? People were uniformly just unhappy with having more choices. They were less likely to buy, and they were more unhappy with their choices that they bought. So we have more tools that are better abstractions. So you think, okay, we should automatically be building better like platforms. So the first thing you run into as a data scientist is figuring out what tools can actually do all of these. Now, if you're lucky, you have an ML engineer, ML ops engineer, ML platform that will help you figure this out. But if you don't, this is your first, first decision. This is your next decision your deployment pattern. So there's a question of like, has ML ops really kind of closed the dev to broad gap? On paper, it looks really simple, like doing ML in production. Uh, but ask any new data scientist, or even a lot of you recovering data scientists, what was it like when you got your first job or moved to a new company? All these different standards that you had to relearn. And that platform, what a joke. 
But what should an ML ops platform even be doing at this point? Now, any platform should be solving the cognitive overload problem, as in it should make the shit work less. You know, it should not live in your head rent free, and you should instead be able to work on more cool stuff. You know, more businessy. You're trying to minimize or maximize three different dimensions. You're trying to increase how fast your people can get their work done. You're trying to increase how much work is getting through, how many models. And you're also trying to decrease risk. You put together these different pieces, these different tools, both technical and procedural, for a very nice, beautiful LEGO experience. And what's really interesting is that a lot of times I think we like to have like resume-driven amnesia, where we keep thinking that like actually developing and designing platforms is like super complicated in rocket science. And I like to upset everyone by saying, eh, I don't know, I don't think so. Because there's two dimensions we can kind of think about. First one is the ML lifecycle. The second one is level of abstraction. And we can even kind of figure out what are the metrics that we want to measure at each layer. What do we care about? Your first layer is just, does it run? And how well does it run? Your second one is, can you actually deliver on the ML promises? And the top one is, do people like using it, or are they essentially going to go engage in shadow, go engage in shadow IT? Are, are they just going to run around your back to go build something else? Now, the big talk over on the ML side, right, is closing the dev to prod gap, because there is a certain acknowledgment that a lot of tools, they like to kind of pick their lane. They're either a prod tool or they're a dev tool. But you could also look at it as a data to ML gap. Once again, we, we feel like we have this really nice idea, this aspirational idea of where data and ML should come together. But then we also like to talk about many, many different stacks, especially on the vendor side. We absolutely love that. Of course, on the practitioner side, it's a terrible experience. Because now it's like, what do you actually build? What are you focused on? Even then, you're still dealing with the fact that like real life happens, right? So there's the big data era. There is the ML ops era. And now there is a path to AI hell paid by prompts. So this was the experience uh, that I, I got to experience when essentially ChatGPT came out, Code Interpreter came, Code Interpreter came out, Cohere, you name it. There's a lot of people who hit my inbox going like, so we just like, got approved for our MLOps initiative. We just got budget. We finally got buy-in. We finally got the engineers. And now we're being told by our hippos that we now need to go figure out the LLMs thing. And we need to potentially either not hire the data science engineers that we were going to hire and instead hire these quote-unquote prompt engineers that we don't even know what, what they do. And we also have to go buy this new stack. Some key snapshots of the convo that many of you have seen, for example, are reinforcement learning from human feedback. Maybe that was accompanied by someone saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we also need to find ways to get like, you know, annotation and performance metrics and monitoring in. Maybe you see a lot of people saying rag, 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 rag. Oh, so we need a vector database. And there's this other stack of stuff. There's all these things we need to buy in order to stay relevant. Now, LLMs are cool. Like, as someone that was on the platform team over at MailChimp, we got to play around with this uh, over when ChatGPT hadn't been released, but GPT 3.5 had been. And it really did kind of help us automate the POC part. There's a lot of things that we could do really, really quick that normally would have been that 80% of work is data, right? It's cleaning it, it's warring it, it's kind of figuring out if there's signal, and then it's documenting it. And documentation is the one thing that everyone can agree on sucks to do. So given how easy it is to do some of these things now with 
ChatGPT. It's another kind of risk factor. Data scientists were basically just writing scikit-learn and PyTorch code. Are they even like relevant at that point? But I like to kind of take a little bit more of a hopeful approach. Before, you had to go from data to model product, only to figure out that your product sucked. But now you get to find that out earlier. You get to find out whether or not there is something worth investing in much, much earlier. And more importantly, that gets to drive the data conversation, improving the data quality, the data governance. Because much like public health, it's hard to convince someone to do the right thing until basically you have a bunch of people that have died of typhoid fever. Now there's this talk about the AI engineer role that's coming out. And it's partially what prompted this talk idea was this idea that we need another new role. We had data scientists, data engineer, ML engineer, ops engineer, so now we need an AI engineer, even though many of us don't understand what AI engineering actually like means, you know? Um, because shouldn't AI engineers actually be like roboticists? Hmm. But instead, maybe we take this as an indication that the composition of people are coming into the ML space is changing. Maybe we instead think of this as a cry for help from our business partners who are basically just saying, hey, we need you to provide more value. Now, this is a breakdown, supposedly, of this new role. And actually, I really like, I really like Andy's sum summarization of the discussions that are going on. Now, this was kind of a fun take because building value is a huge topic of conversation, right? Not just in the ML world, but in the data engineering world. A lot of times, that is basically what is missing from conversations. So what exactly is the thin layer that you're building? Now, something that I have to break to you guys is if you're looking at LMs or LM ops to kind of save your businesses, they won't. They are a pattern of, de of deployment a team could use, but it will not save your business. But the thing that is kind of interesting is how similar some of the tools are. So this was the ML stack that the full stack deep learning folks over at Berkeley said, hey, you guys should focus on this if you're first building out your POC. This is the ML ops community's take on what the LM ops stack looks like. Sequoias. A lot of similarities, both good and bad. For example, a lot of challenges of running LMs. So these are the challenges that people have right now with just vanilla LMs. Security and privacy, failure of AI systems, all that great stuff. And what's really funny is, once again, this is about vanilla ML. Latency, hiring the right people, architecture, all that. Similarities around LLMs. It's funny how you swap in this hot new sexy technology and it's the same issues just with a different name. Like I said, I'm not actually expecting you guys to read every single slide, because I don't. But LMs are important in forcing the conversation about the importance of data and vanilla ML. Because you have a lot of different options for, in this case, LMs, but generative AI tools, you have a lot of different ways that you can essentially make them much more specific to your particular use case. But in order to make it specific to your use case, you need data, and you need good data. This divide between data and ML, frankly, doesn't really need to exist. It's almost like LLMs are the marriage counselor bringing in two people, saying, hey, you guys just need to talk. You live in the same apartment, you kind of do a lot of the same stuff, and yet you're just kind of living your lives totally different. Checkbooks are being balanced differently. 
a really important area where data is becoming a part of the ML LM conversation in a way that hasn't before is the fact that everyone's freaking out that we're running out of data sets. Now, what does this actually mean? So in order to train more and better LLMs or foundational models, we need to have higher quality data sets. Well, there's two things. We need more data. It could be terrible quality, but we also need high quality data sets. In this case, they're looking at the number of academic data sets in English. And they're like, yo, we're gonna run out at some point. Poor quality data will run out you know, less soon. So what's the answer to we're running out of public data? Proprietary data? Generate more data? Create better data out of existing data? So MOPS and DOPS still incredibly relevant. Still so relevant. And what's really funny is that a lot of the issues with LMs, they're engineering problems. They're a lot of the same problems that you would have interacting with an external API. So my, my you know, position to you guys is, look, LMs isn't the final concluding statement. It's another tool. It's another tool alongside embeddings in you know, the existing deep learning models, alongside traditional ML. So if we were to kind of evaluate data scientists the way we would say koalas or patty melons, apparently those guys are of least concern and they are also very cute, which makes me happy that they are of least concern. Not so much koalas, I mean, you know, those, are, those are goners but I love those guys, so, you know. Now, did anyone else witness a little bit of, a, I know I said, did you guys individually panic? So I'll let you guys swing, because most of you didn't raise your hands. Um, but how many of your leadership, how many of you had leadership or other people internally that panicked, or even family and friends? Yeah. Now, I did promise that this would be about data scientists, right? And I kind of talked about it sort of indirectly, the, the work of data science and ML. The interesting thing about that whole extinction definition, right, is there's not exactly going to be a meteor that comes out and wipes everyone out. People are a lot more flexible, and they grow. Data engineers, for example, have transformed many a time. Many of you were at one point database engineers or database administrators. Before that, many of you might have been IT systems folks. QA, you name it, right? And same with data scientists. And really, this idea that data scientists, all they do is do graphs and experimentation design is a little bit of a falsehood. They're a pretty varied group. They eventually go off, maybe to other specialties. But is that really them going extinct, or is that the fact that we've gotten much more mature in that discipline? And we're solving different problems. So here are things I would love for you to think about. Highly, regulatory, highly regulated industries and in, in small companies. For example, I worked at Teladoc. We were a digital health company. We worked with a population of people with chronic conditions. The biggest size we could get in terms of our experiments, i.e. sending behavioral notifications, was maybe about 1,000 or less. You bet your butt, I was doing power and significance level calculations every time we did an experiment. And they're still doing that. More importantly, this kind of socialization, we could kind of like throw our hands up, but it's not gonna go away anytime soon. I mean, just think about that explosion of tools. Now, the part that's really kind of fun for both data engineers as business partners to data scientists is there are just a lot of ops things they can't address without significant effort. 
So many organizations still want a single unified abstraction for their data scientists. That's what they're banking on. And also, ML is hard. It doesn't matter if it's LMs. Because essentially, if you were a company that went from traditional software to ML software, I mean, just look at the number of tests. And people hate writing tests. That's like 10 times the work that people hate doing. It's important. And really, it expands to all these, all these boxes. So these are our opportunities ahead. Hopefully, indirectly, you've understood that uh, I don't think it's a tooling problem. I do think it's an abstraction problem. We've solved a lot of this stuff. And more importantly, companies are at different problem solving stages. Hopefully, this is also your second takeaway. There's the ML procs or data procs. And more importantly, we do have to design systems, ML systems, around data. And it's about evolving. It's not about extinction. Data scientists or people who do data work are just so well positioned. And if you're a data engineer that wants to do ML, even better. So people kind of only think about the title. They don't actually remember the details. Like the fact that in 2012, data scientists just want to build things. They don't want to get advice. Being a consultant is a dead zone. The care and feeding of data scientists, that, that paragraph is really good. I encourage you to go read it. And more importantly, uh, vanilla technology, still super important. Runway ML, open AI. Look at those data engineering roles they're hiring for. And if you read between the lines, look at why they're hiring them. Because if they were just dog fooding their own food, they wouldn't need to hire any more data engineers to do ML, or data engineers to produce stuff for ML, and they wouldn't really care about ML use cases. So hopefully, you guys will be free of me very, very soon. But I'm hoping the takeaways you have are, first off, there are plenty of opportunities still to collaborate with data scientists, too. The work that you guys do as data engineers is incredibly important. It's not less important, it's more important. And number three, the opportunities are still there. All the talks that people are gonna give today about PySpark, about practices, those are still very, very relevant, and I hope you guys enjoy them as much as I will. And feel free to catch me at the panel or in the hallways. And that's it. Thanks, Vicki.